Joe Cacharo, senior content producer for The Score. What's up, brother? How are we doing? How's it going, JD? Bad. I hate it. I'm so sad. Yeah. <laughs> like, I, I've been waiting for this for 24 years. Like, I know you're in the same camp. Like, I have the memory yeah. of watching Steve Nash as a little kid and going, oh, God, uh, this is really going to change and transform the country. We had the Carter effect. We had the Steve Nash effect. It was all kind of building towards this thing. And they just lost to, yeah, uh, a team that threw three guys out there primarily that – don't play in the NBA that absolutely cooked them. I guess, like, where are you at in terms of the level of this disappointment? I mean, it's pretty high. That Steve Nash-led team from 24 years ago did more with less, if you think about it, or did yeah. the same with less. They both made the quarterfinals and lost. Um, it's. Uh, I, I think that if you look at the big picture as a whole, uh, this team won bronze at the World Cup. They came in with the second most talent, the second most NBA talent in this tournament. And they, you know, openly and loudly embraced the expectations and the pressure that came with all of that. And they didn't even make the medal round. And I think that has to be seen as an abject failure. Yeah. And that, you know, that doesn't mean that uh, the last 15 years of building didn't mean anything. It doesn't mean that the uh, talent is still coming and Canada basketball in general isn't in a good place. But you can acknowledge all that while still also acknowledging this particular result was an abject failure, and I don't really see how anyone can see it otherwise. So obviously Jamal Murray's eating it the most, right? Like yep. if you look on socials, he's and and there's just no question. Like he was the most disappointing player in the tournament. I do want to get to him, but I I think that the thing I am most disappointed in wasn't necessarily Jamal Murray because he showed us what he was going to do throughout this tournament. Like it, it shouldn't have been a surprise to people if this was like a one-off game where I thought he really choked. I'd go, yeah, okay, but now nah, this is the way that he was playing. The thing that really killed me was the first half is just how flustered they looked, how quickly they abandoned the things that had been working for them throughout the tournament. The fact that it just did become ISO ball that was resulting in, you know, late shots that it was poor decision-making on the defensive end that was resulting in quick fouls that I thought really let France's big guys get comfortable. Like where do you, or yeah, how do you evaluate the this game in terms of where you put the highest level of disappointment? Honestly, even though I get what you're saying in that, you know, he was having a, a brutal tournament and so yeah. maybe it was to be expected, I still think the Jamal Murray factor is the most disappointing to me. Look, I, yeah. as a team, were they disappointing? Yes. Was the start nauseating to watch and so frustrating? Yes. I also think look, part of it is the Wemby factor and that he did not have a good offensive game, but that presence in the paint, like yeah. the, Canada looks shook. And I know you could say, listen, they, they knew they were going to play Wemby. It's not, they weren't surprised to show up and find him in the paint, but that does do something to you. I think that definitely played a factor in mucking up their offense. They did not look uh, as willing to drive, as willing to attack. The off ball movement didn't look the same. And yeah, it turned into a lot of ISO ball, a lot of, Uh, uncertainty and indecision. And again, they deserve some of the blame for that, for sure. The coaching staff has to take some of the blame for that, but at least I can point to something and say, Hey, that happens a lot when teams play Wemby and the fouling issue to me comes down to, you know, the lack of size and the lack of quality bigs that to be honest, we always knew was going to undo this team at Mm -hmm. some point, right? Like everyone thought of it as like, Oh, they don't have that true big in the middle, but it also filtered down to like their general bigs rotation was Powell, Olenek and Birch and Lyles. And so besides Wemby, even a Yabusele or a Lasort is a lot stronger than the power forwards they're going up against. And they were abusing them. They were bullying the Canadian power forwards. And that's, I think, what was leading to a lot of the foul trouble. Like, I know a lot of people are complaining about the whistle. There were a few bad calls. I'll admit that. But, like, if anyone thinks the officials are why this game went the way it did, they are shameless homers. Yeah, you don't don't know the game. They're shameless homers. Yeah, you're either shameless homer or you don't know the game. Because, like, yeah, it it was not a major storyline. I'm sorry. I just don't think it was. No. Yeah, like, did France take a lot more free throws? Yes, because Canada physically could not match up with their front court and could do nothing but foul them while trying to guard them. And so I take all of that into account, but to me, like, Jamal Murray being a shell of himself for the entire tournament, and particularly in this game, is the most disappointing part because, again, 
the bigs and the size issue, I figured at some point that was going to do them. I didn't think it would be the quarterfinals, but I thought eventually you could say that's why they lost. Mm -hmm. I did not think Jamal Murray being arguably their worst rotation player, if not one of their worst two players, was going to be a big part of why they lost. And if Jamal Murray had played up to his standards and Canada had got what they expected to get from every player on this roster, they could have overcome some of those deficiencies. Like, again, we knew that the bigs were going to be an issue. We thought they'd have the best backcourt in this tournament, literally, full stop. Instead, you had Isaiah Mm Cordigne almost scoring as many points in the quarterfinals as Jamal Murray did in the entire tournament. Mm -hmm. So to me, that's the part that's like, you know, again, it it doesn't take away from everything he's done over the last few years, but uh, he's got to wear this. Yeah, so that was a major disappointment, and it was the the most unexpected of the disappointing things that happened yesterday and over the course of the whole tournament. And yeah, like I, I think had Joel Murray been as good as he was supposed to be, Canada could have overcome the expected flaws a little better. Yeah, and I'm with you on it. I just looked at it from the standpoint of. The Indiana Pacers during the postseason lost their star point guard who's on Team USA, and they found a way to turn to Andrew Nemhard. And I don't think Nemhard was as brilliant by any stretch of the imagination throughout this tournament. Um, I thought there were moments where he looked nervous as well. And in that game, they just they they couldn't even find a way to kind of phase him in and make him feel like he had any sort of impact. But I do think that Jordy Fernandez at one point needed to go, hey, we're gonna need Nemhard because the only thing that is going to work for us is the having two guards that can attack thing. Like what was so bad about Canada's first half? It was the moments where all of a sudden Lou Dort was trying to get in his bag or when Dylan Brooks was trying to create on the offensive end and you were like, holy crap, this is awful. Like, don't, please don't do this. And then there were these moments with Jamal Murray. And again, I know he knocked down his first couple shots, but it's, it's like he couldn't, he couldn't actualize or realize that he isn't the same guy anymore. He's dribbling the ball for, 15, 16 seconds looking for a screen from Jokic. It's like Jokic isn't coming. And then all of a sudden he's trying to create against someone that's bigger, longer, more athletic, and I don't know if in better shape or healthier, but it resulted in either turnovers or horrible looking shots that you didn't think had a prayer of going in. And so, yes, I'm with you. And I, I, I'm, I'm genuinely on the, I'm at the point now, like I just mentioned the, in the, in the lead up before you came on that I'm not sure Jamal Murray's even the same guy. Like I, I don't think that you can bank on him just recovering at some point for Denver. I think that if you were a fan of them and you were looking at his contract extension, this tournament and what he did in the postseason would really worry you. But yeah, Canada, for them to come out like that and to just kind of make no adjustments to the first half, like you mentioned the Wemby thing, how he takes away the rent, 100%, 100%, 100%, 100%. But he also sat on the bench for the vast majority of the second quarter. Canada was yeah. down, I think, what, 11 points when he went to the bench and then they finished the half down 16? Like... I just could not believe how stagnant the offense was, how slow they were to adjust, and that they just kind of kept running the same thing out there, which was these bad drives that didn't really lead anywhere. Yeah, and they were, again, even like even that rotation of bigs wasn't helping either because, no. it, you know, I, I hate to say it, but they were kind of useless out there in that, like you look at, they start the game with Dylan Brooks kind of taking on this inspiring role as the Wemby stopper, the undersized Wemby stopper. Okay, cool. And to be honest with you, in that role, Brooks did as well as you could possibly imagine. Yeah. But, okay, so that means Powell's now not guarding the opposing team's uh, center. But he's also not quick enough to stay with their, you know, power forwards. But he's also not offensively talented enough where you can dump the ball to him and he's going to uh, overmatch someone on the other end. So you end up at a point where it's like, all right, like what, what were the Canadian bigs doing yesterday? Just rebounding. Yeah. Okay, sure. Powell had a nice rebounding game. I, I get it that, you know, there are other things big men can do that don't always show up in the box where there's screening there's, but like they were almost useless yesterday. Yeah. Uh, and then on the Nemhard though, listen, I don't think he was, great in this tournament might not even have been good but he was by far their best reserve yeah i don't know what that says right i'm saying that i'm not even sure if he was good overall in the tournament but he was by far their best reserve yeah the I think you could just argue- didn't show up at the, in the way that we really thought it was going to like that was one of the strengths of the team right you look at the roster and go right. look at how many guys they have and they just were never able to weaponize that in any meaningful way and i will say too is like nemhard was one of the guys 
But in that game in particular, and I, I don't want to nitpick Fernandez because I actually think that he's a really great coach. And yeah. like one of my lasting takeaways from this is God, I, I hope he actually remains in this position and that they don't move off of him or that the Brooklyn job takes him away from this. Like he, he just done a great job. But if your bigs were giving you so little defensively throughout that entire game, right? Like where it was Powell was playing way too aggressive on the perimeter and then just fouling guys couldn't give you anything offensively. He takes a look at Kelly Olenek for what two oh, possessions and then just Kelly fu- Olenek came in the game and immediately his first touch was he had uh, Evan Fournier yeah. on him. And he couldn't, yeah, he couldn't get a shot. Yeah, that was, off, that was tough. A shot off. Yeah. I just wanted to see a little bit more of it where I'm like, your offense is stagnant and your, your, your bigs are giving up everything anyway. Like, give me, give me three, four minutes of Kelly Olenek where you're trying to run the offense through him. Like, this is somebody who has scored major, major points in international play before, who is an offensive facilitator. Like when they were gummed up in that first half, I, I wanted to see him a bit like I know it was a really bad possession. And then he did the same thing defensively where it's like he got cooked on both, but given like what you had uh, in reserve, I, I think I needed to see it at least for a few minutes. Yeah, no, I hear you in, in general. I would have liked to see them even try, especially when Wemby was on the bench going small yeah. and even having no bigs out there and they didn't really do it. And I'm surprised about that because Fernandez has been pretty open to experimenting and kind of finding what works. Um, and then with respect to the bench, look, I know I, you know, I hate to keep harping on Jamal Murray, but uh-huh. again, how much of that comes down to that disappointment? Look, if someone had told you, I mentioned they should have had the best backcourt in this tournament, but then if someone had told you coming in, oh, by the way, because they want Dort and Brooks out there together, which works pretty well, they're actually going to bring Jamal Murray off the bench. In an Olympics or in international ball, you would have thought, oh, their, their bench is going to be awesome. Murray and Nemhart off the bench? Like, Murray's going to be so much better than the average reserve in this mm-hmm. tournament. And again... Instead, we're coming out of the tournament saying that he was arguably Canada's weakest link. And that just, to me, so much of the disappointment comes back to that. They just, that is such a huge piece. The guy that probably everyone came into the tournament thinking was their second best player. Yeah. Ended uh, up just not giving them anything. What was the tournament in Toronto that Jamal Murray played in uh, when he was like 19, 18? Uh, Is it the Pan Ams? Yeah, I think it might have been the Pan Am games. But thinking, uh, I I was thinking about that moment of his first Canadian international moment where we went, holy crap. And then sort of his rise through the NBA, which was, I remember when he was drafted, he was viewed as a tweener and people weren't sure exactly if he was going to be athletic enough to play the position. And he slipped in the draft a little bit and... Um, there was just, I don't know. He, he had so much promise for this team. I watching him in the the championship a, a season ago and thinking about this guy playing for Canada, thinking about that backcourt that of course it's the number one disappointment. Like you're, you're dead, right? I, I, I'm not going to push back on that whatsoever. I was just crushed by so many things in the game. And I went, this yeah. guy is the primary reason that Canada's ceiling completely changed why they weren't able to cover up some of those flaws. The other ones that we're talking about, I just like, I'm almost having a tough time dealing with how bad he was as a player. Like again, he, he looked slow. He couldn't move laterally. If you remember the, the, there was the exhibition game that they had against the Americans. Right. And there were a couple moments in that game where it was like, Oh, he's got the ball and he's going up against a call and oh wait, he couldn't do anything like, Oh, he got stuffed yeah. again. Oh, he turned the ball over again. And he went, oh, okay, well, maybe he just wasn't in it. And then to see that throughout the tournament, I, I mentioned he's missed now. Let me pull this up. 156 games in the last four seasons. He shot 30% from three on high volume during the postseason. He had multiple games in the postseason where we thought, oh, my God, like, is, why, why doesn't he look the same? We see this at the tournament. Like, I, I know people are talking about the calf. It has been quiet around him. You talk about the contract murmurs that have been coming out of Denver in terms of like his disappointment and the team kind of trying to stay silent on it. Like, do you have major concerns that about Jamal Murray's future in general? Like, do you think that this is kind of a one-off? You're kind of putting this away and saying, Hey, get healthy during the off season. Or yeah. Do you think that the, the best versions of Jamal Murray might be over and done with? I mean, that would be sad, but I think it's definitely possible. And yeah. You know, I think he, even though he's never made an all-star team, he was so good at his peak, even if that was like a year ago. Yeah. Um, and, and has had so many 
big games and is such a playoff performer. Like, he's had so many high moments that, look, you could point to that and say, hey, he might never be better than that again. Um, am I concerned long-term about, like, his durability and stuff? Of course, because, you know, he's got a major knee issue in his past. He's a, a guard who's not huge. Like, those guys don't age the best. Um, I still think if he can just, you know, maybe need some time off, get healthy. The thing is, now you're ending in August and – training camp all of a sudden is less than two months away. I don't know how healthy he can get for the season. I hope he can. Um, but, yeah, you're talking about a guy who's had a major knee issue who hasn't looked 100% uh, in a while now and is dealing with this calf inju- injury that's been bothering him since the spring. There's just a lot kind of going on. And also, you know, you talk about those contract talks with Denver. Jamal Murray, to me, is one of those typical guys you can look to um, – where in the previous CBA, even as a non-star, quote-unquote, he's a no-brainer guy you max, especially when he's a homegrown talent if you're Denver. In the new CBA, with the second apron, uh, with the more putative tax penalties, when teams are being much more selective about how they distribute those dollars, Jamal Murray's not a no-brainer max guy. And I think those tensions, I I don't want to say they played a factor in how he played for Canada, but that has to be weighing on his mind. I think the contract Jamal Murray's looking at is not the contract he would have been looking at a year or two ago. Dude, um, he's a pending free agent this year. And he went to the Olympics. And teams, when you have an injury, are pretty reticent to uh, have guys go to this. Like, obviously, Jamal Murray has done enough for Denver that they weren't going to, like, push back in a meaningful enough way, right? This wasn't... uh, you know, Golden State with Wiggins, where they go, yeah, we we are dying to trade you, and we cannot have you be injured. Like we we need this. Yeah. Um, although you could make the case that Wiggins, you know, what he did in their finals too, getting a championship, he should have had that leeway. But who cares? Um, a pending free agent who's looking for that kind of money to go to this tournament and play this way, um, it's bad. And and my biggest reason for it is. I can't imagine. I, I, I believe Jamal Murray is a patriot. I think he cares deeply about Canada basketball. He's been on the record multiple times about wanting to be there for Canada basketball. But he also did miss the World Cup last year, the qualifier, because he said, I, I'm dinged up. Like, I can't do this. Yeah. His financial future's on the line. He went and he played. I, I'm sorry. I'm just not buying the idea that his calf was so hurt that this is what has caused... This version right. of him. I think that if he was meaningfully hurt, like in a way that he thought was really going to compromise him, he would have sat this thing out because he's in, like I said, 156, two full seasons of NBA basketball he's missed over the last four years. For him to re-aggravate this or hurt this, we're talking about missing out on, you know, tens of millions of dollars here. Yeah. I just, I don't think he loves Canada that much. You know what I mean? Like I... And- I think he might be a step slower. Yeah, and and let's be real. Like at this point in the tournament, they were playing a single game elimination. Mm-hmm. Uh, if he was not, if he was not healthy enough to be out there or to make Jordy an impact, wouldn't have played him. Exactly, exactly. And so again, he was out there, and he has to wear it, just yeah. like this whole team has to wear it, and. You know, I think, and I wrote about this yesterday as well, um, but I think the disappointment is, look, this is not the case of a team that was playing their best Mm -hmm. and just lost to superior or even equal competition. Because if that had been the case in this tournament, which was, you know, it was billed as, and I believe it is, the best um, international basketball tournament ever staged in terms of, like, the depth of talent, the quality all around, the balance of talent, but... Listen, if they had played a great game yesterday and they're, they got pretty much what they expected from most of their roster and they just lost because sometimes things happen, especially in a single game elimination, that's one thing. But they can't say that. They were eliminated and aren't going to play even for any medal because the second most talented team in the tournament leaves the tournament knowing that most of its players underperformed in this tournament. Yeah. You know, like, and, and it's weird to say that because they went three and one and overall, you know, they talked to the toughest group and all that, but really like, okay, Shea predictably brilliant. I don't think anyone can argue that. Uh, Dort 
it, I don't see how anyone could have asked for more from that guy. He, like Herculean effort. Yep. Uh, Brooks did not shoot the ball at all well at all yesterday. And, you know, his decision-making inside the arc, we know what that's like. But again, overall, as a two-way starter, uh, the things he did against bigger opponents, don't think as a whole you could have asked for much more from Dylan Brooks mm. in this tournament. R.J. Barrett was pretty fantastic all tournament long as a consistent and efficient secondary scorer creator. Those four guys to me, you got what you expected in some cases, maybe more, and you got what you needed. And then some from that quartet Mm -hmm. beyond that, can you point to anyone on this roster of 10 NBA guys, 11 at some point, NBA guys and say, Anyone else played up to your expectations? I can't. No, not definitely Maybe not. Maybe Ken Birch? No. Like, yeah, I know Ken Birch definitely did because I would have said to you before, like when Ken Birch was announced to the roster, I went, well, he's unplayable. I got to tell you, if you're a Raptors fan too, I know it was the circumstances, but Ken Birch getting major minutes as Kelly Olynyk is stapled to the bench, knowing that you gave yeah. up assets to get off of Chris or Ken Birch and that you just gave Kelly Olynyk a contract extension. I was like, that's not the best feeling that I would have as a little secondary storyline, but no, there, yeah. there weren't guys. And again, to get back like to blaming Jamal Murray, which we're doing a lot of, um, I actually think if he wasn't there at this tournament, then you would have gotten more out of Emhart early, right? Like you would have been forced to yeah. rely upon him more. Um, I don't know if Nikhil, Nikhil was so good for them in the world cup and just, like, oh man, that guy, I don't know what happened in the spring, but that guy, you know, he slumped in the West finals yeah. against Dallas and he through. has just not recovered. Like he yeah. was really bad in that exhibition against the States, mm-hmm. looks awkward in general in the exhibition games and then missed every shot he took in the Olympics. Yeah, no, it was, it was awful. But again, they just, they were desperate for another ball handler that could create space, create space for others, create shots for themselves they needed another creator like, and <sighs> RJ was great throughout the tournament. So I really don't want to kind of blast him for that game. And he was fine. And stat line, you look at it and it's like, all right, it's okay. But that is kind of one of those moments where they did have Wemby down there and you go, well, he affects the game. He affects the play. I'm like, he f- affects RJ Barrett the most. Cause he's got to be at the basket. He's got to be at yeah. the rim. And this is the one thing that I, the reason why I don't believe in RJ Barrett is like a primary NBA guy is that I just don't think that the athleticism is great enough for him to score inside consistently against the best interior defenders in the NBA. And then when he has to stretch his game out and he's got to rely on that shooting, it's like, he doesn't have a mid range game that you believe in. He doesn't have a three point shot. That's consistent enough. Like uh, I, yeah. Um, I thought that one of the biggest things was he sort of disappeared in that first half of the game. They kind of leaned on Shea too much. And then all of a sudden, because he wasn't cooking, it empowered Dort and more specifically Brooks to be like, well, we've got to try to create a shot. And it's like, you guys can't do that. Then when they went to the bench, yeah. Jamal Murray didn't give them anything. There was like a little glimmer of hope at the very beginning. And then from that point forward, it was a disaster, man. I was like, you want to talk about things you would have never told yourself going back with, with regards to Jamal Murray. I was sitting there watching the game with Ennis and texting friends, like pleading for Fernandez to take him out of the game. Like imagine yep. telling yourself that, that you'd be sitting there watching an elimination game for Canada where they're down, where they need shots. And you're going, you have to take him out. Please take him out for the love of God. Get him off the floor. <laughs> like That's yeah, no, it's, that's bad. It's, it's shocking. And that's kind of what I was saying, right? Where yeah. it's like, it's one thing to lose because of the flaws you already knew existed coming into the tournament mm-hmm. and that they couldn't really do much about. It's another thing to lose that when a way. big part of the loss is because the guy who was supposed to be your second best player was bad enough that we were begging the coach to take him out of an elimination game. Here's what I would say though, in terms of the future, because this is, you know, I guess sort of where we got to spin this now because you know, the disappointment, the layers of it, and I think those have been, you know, we've gone over them. Um, but when Canada moves forward and, and I know I, I do hate the like four years from now game just because you never know what could happen. Right? Like, yeah, you four years to, is a long it's, time. It's exactly. I even thought about how maybe as patriotic as Jamal Murray has been, and he does seem like a guy who has a very thick skin, like an experience like this may have soured him on returning, right? Like who knows? Um, like Wiggins, when he was down in Venezuela, what in 2015 for the, what was that tournament? It was the, I, I can never remember what any of these things are, uh, but yeah, 
the World Championships or whatever it was. The, it was the FIBA America. Yeah, it was. It was the FIBA Americas. That's what it was. It was not the FIBA World Cup. It was just the FIBA Americas. That's exactly it. It's like we watched that team with all those guys and you went like the idea that you weren't going to ever see Andrew Wiggins in a Team Canada uniform at that point was unfathomable. And it ends up happening. So I'm not taking any of these guys as guarantees. You don't know whose contracts are going to be where. You don't know if a guy is going to be injured. Like go on down the line. Um, it, like I thought it was funny. People were going and banking on Zach Eady. They're like, Oh, when Zach Eady's there, Zach Eady's there. I went, Zach Eady's like seven foot five. <laughs> uh, the idea that he's going to be healthy four years from now at this tournament or that his team's going to want him to go play is he's up for a big contract. Cause I'm like, I'm not buying that, but yeah, Canada's going to have a depth of, I think ball handlers n- next time, like Matherin specifically and Shaden yeah. sharp. You think about yeah. adding those two guys to the mix and then more experience for Nemhard and where Shay's going to be. Uh, it's kind of throughout his prime. And the fact that I do think he's going to be there, even if you don't have Jamal Murray, that's four guys who can handle the ball and put pressure on the rim, which is more than what they had at this tournament. I'm not worried about the future of that, but the big man stuff, like you look at what they have right now. And yes, there's Zach Eady and there's Brandon Clark um, who aren't there. But again, Clark injury prone guy, Eady seven foot five. Do, do you have faith that they're going to be able to develop this a little bit better? Like, is there something that, you know, you're thinking about right now when it comes to the size issue, how they're going to be able to address this because yeah, that tournament, like that was Lasort and Yabuselli specifically eating them up that way, I think does have to be of an eye opener for the program going, Hey, if you really want to consider meddling at this thing and being a real international player, you are going to have to have some credible big men. Yeah, they need quality. They need at least one quality big man that is on somewhat of the same timeline as the rest of this core. Mm-hmm. And I think the like the obvious answer there is Edie. Edie's the the big hope. But as you mentioned, there's no guarantees he'll be healthy given his size, and we have to see how he develops and all that. But again, like like I was saying, like four years is a long time mm-hmm. in sports. It's an especially long time in the drama that is the NBA and you just can't take anything for granted. There are great players right now that you know, are young and you can imagine should be still great in four years, but you just can't assume anything. You don't know how injuries are going to go. You don't know how team dynamics are going to go. You just don't know. And so like, do I have faith that Canada will still be the second most talented basketball country in four years? Yes. I think it will continue to separate itself from the rest of the world in that regard. But can I guarantee you that they will place in a way in the World Cup to assure themselves in the Olympic spot? Can I guarantee you that mm-hmm. then when the Olympics roll around, they will be able to bring their actual best team to the tournament? Like I can't guarantee you with any of that. And that's what makes, again, this so disappointing because this was their chance to at least make a statement on the Olympic stage like they did at the World Cup. And mm-hmm. they fell very far short of that. Well, dude, and this is the other part of it. When you talk about the guarantees, had Canada meddled, right? They let, let's say they get to, uh, the, the finals. And this is viewed as this like incredibly positive story. And these guys come away from this experience, like thrilled. Like we saw the momentum from the world cup have the direct impact on this, right? Where these guys seem to all get along with one another, liked one another, wanted to be around one another more. They wanted to represent Canada. It really felt like a true culture shift. The, the level of disappointment that you have here, I, I do think changes the projection model. Like if you go to that gold medal game, hell, you win a bronze medal. The excitement around the program is completely different and you feel far more confident in guys wanting to be there. Like if you are Benedict Mather and you're watching this, you're like, hell yeah, I can't wait to be there. God, I would have killed to be at this Olympics. Those guys are all coming back with the positive experience. They can't stop talking about it, right? Like there's nothing, you know, your friends go on a trip and they have the best time and they come back and they start telling you all about it. And you're like, God, I, 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 we should do this trip next year. You know, let's all, So you're saying but, none of these guys have FOMO that they weren't. No, there. who's looking at this going, man, I sure wish I was there. Like, I don't think that's a thing. And I would question if I was some of these other guys, like, yeah, if you're Nemhard, you're like, man, I, I just played in an, you know, Eastern conference finals and got the ball all the time. And I just went and played for Canada. I didn't get the ball. This is actually one of the things that happens with team USA. They talk about the dynamics of the players where some guys, they don't get enough share shot share. That's why they brought, you know, Derek white. That's why they brought right. drew holiday. 
Like there are real dynamics to a basketball team. It's not as it's not a certainty of just you bring the best talent or you can always get the best guys. Like if that was the case, Canada would have a different roster this time around as well. I, I just the way they lost and the disappointing nature of it. I'm trying to separate my Team Canada fan trauma from it. Like, you know, all of the disappointment with what the reality yeah. is. But I really do believe that there's a piece of it, which is like you hear people go, yeah, they're going to build off of it. You know, you go, what? You know, it's this is four years from now. Like, these qualifiers yeah. are a long time removed. This is a long time to sit with this and stew on this and not be happy about this and not bring back positive memories about the tournament. Like this was this could actually have lasting and bad impacts on a program that has not been consistent, that has not been able to always draw its best guys or keep players happy. I just, yeah, I, I don't rule out the idea that there are lasting implications from this that um, ha- make it more difficult to return all of these guys or bring in other guys in the future. Yeah, I think what you have to hope is that some of these guys watching, whether it's a Matherin or an Edie or whoever, yeah. um, look at it the opposite way and, and so. feel like you know they want to contribute to this and want it to be better and don't want this to happen again. And that same thing goes for the guys that are there, right? That the guys that were part of this experience, one, took pride in being at the Olympics representing Canada and, and feel like they now have unfinished business. That's the hope. But to your point, we mm. can't guarantee that that's how they all feel. And certainly can't guarantee – we can't guarantee what this team will look like when the World Cup rolls around uh, mm-hmm. three years again, let alone four years. Like, there are just way too many uncertainties to brush this result aside as like, oh, it's okay. They'll be better next time. Like, we don't know that. <laughs> we really don't. Mm-hmm. Oof. Yeah. Um, let's hope that you've got it right and not the way that I'm – forecasting it is the right way. Cause I just think if you were reading all the stuff about Jamal Murray online, you know, you're a young fan, you're reading all this. You're like, I want that to be me. Like, I don't know. Man, there's, I don't know if you saw, there's this, there's this one follow on Twitter. His name's Shrieker. He's a Suns fan. And I find him one of the most hilarious, if not the most hilarious guy on basketball Twitter. And he tweeted after the game that uh, Jamal Murray without Jokic is just Tim Horton way junior. Yeah. That, that is pretty good. Yeah. He, he really, t- honestly, at least Hardaway Jr. and I heard the middle, but at least like he is explosive. At least he's taller. <laughs> like you're shorter, Tim Hardaway Jr. Like, uh, I don't know. Those are very good. Anyway, uh, Joe Cacharo, uh, sorry that this is the reason that you were on here. Uh, I thought it was going to be, I really did. I really thought this was going to be more of a celebration and thinking about, you know, this massive matchup with Germany. But yeah, here we are uh, losing to Gershon Yebiseli. Uh, and uh, yeah, Lasort, Isaiah Cordigne, and Cordigne, who I, I I couldn't even get his name. Like I couldn't even remember his name, even though he lit Canada up for that many points. Anyways, thanks for making time, brother. I always appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for having me. See you, buddy.